around Israel, and Israel revolves around Jerusalem. When you listen to many modern preachers and teachers, especially in social media, you would think that Bible prophecy revolved around Washington, D.C., and the Democrats and the Republicans. But that is a tremendous error if you're a serious student of the Bible. Do not ever forget that Bible prophecy revolves around Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is not only the capital of Israel, but after the rapture and after the tribulation, God will so exalt Jerusalem that she will become the entire capital of the entire world. And the Bible here is in the 122nd Psalm putting that bright light on Jerusalem. Verse 3, Jerusalem is a well-built city. Its seamless walls cannot be breached. All the tribes of Israel, the Lord's people make their pilgrimage here. They come to give thanks to the name of the Lord as the law requires of Israel. Here stand the thrones where judgment is given, the thrones of the dynasty of David. Pray for peace in Jerusalem. In light of what's gone on this weekend, perhaps if you have not already run a highlighter through that in your Bible. Pray for peace in Jerusalem. May all who love this city prosper. O Jerusalem, may there be peace within your walls and prosperity in your palaces. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, may you have peace for the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek what is best for you, O Jerusalem. As we turn our attention to the events that are currently, even as I'm speaking, evolving in Jerusalem and Israel and the Middle East, I want to lay down as a bedrock for where we're about to travel the most important thing this morning is not that you understand all of the high points of the chronology of end time events and final Bible prophecy, although I'm going to do my best to walk through that in this message. But I want to make abundantly clear at the infancy of this message and then at the end of this message, the most important thing is that you're living ready to meet the Lord. There are people who are incredible students of the Bible. And they have devoted themselves to an intellectual ascent to biblical facts and Bible prophecy, but they're not living ready to meet the Lord. Of what value is an intellectual ascent to the precepts of the Bible if you're not living in right relationship with God? And most of you who know me know that I've dedicated almost five decades of my life to missions and world evangelism with one purpose— to help men and women and boys and girls make peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ. But if there ever were a time that you needed to take a hard look at who you are and who you are in Christ and how you're living in light of eternity, I would strongly advise you that you had better get serious about making sure all of your accounts with God are paid in full. And so when I'm done, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Those that are here live in this sanctuary, those that are watching through various social media formats and around the world and you never know anymore. The church that I was just at in Wasilla a year ago, a message that I preached there, over 1.4 million people have listened to that message, not on my YouTube channel, on their church's YouTube channel. The last time that I preached here, you never know. Uh, several hundred thousands of people are listening even though we're here. It's a different day and age. We live in a day and an age where you can hold a microphone in your hand and cameras will cause that message to go to the ends of the earth. And so wherever you are listening from, I want you to have a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. I am going to cover some information and some background details that I think are vitally important for Christians to understand in this time. But if you don't get anything else, make sure that you get, how do I make peace with God? 
And you make peace with God according to the Bible by doing three things. Number one, you have to recognize your sin. There has to be a time in your life when you in humility go to God in prayer and say, Father, I know that I have sinned. I know that I have made mistakes. I know that I have violated your commandments. I recognize my sin. B, you also have to not only recognize your sin, you have to be willing to repent of your sin. And notice that I didn't say able. You're not able to repent of your sin by your own strength and by your own disciplines. Repentance simply means a willingness to turn your back on sin and turn your heart to Jesus Christ. And thirdly, you have to receive Jesus Christ. There is no way to having a right relationship with God but through faith in Jesus Christ. It's oftentimes called the essential doctrine of the Bible. Faith in Christ alone is the only way that you can obtain the forgiveness of sins and the sure knowledge that whatever happens in this world that you'll be ready to meet the Lord. And so as we enter into this message today and talk about what does the Bible say about Israel, war, and final prophecy, I want you to begin to prepare your heart for the invitation that I'll give in the moments to come. And I'd like to have the privilege when I'm done of meeting you here at this altar and personally and publicly praying with me what many people call a sinner's prayer. And those of you that are online, I want you to prepare your heart to pray as well. And today can be an eternal changing moment for you. How many want to live every day ready to meet the Lord? Let's take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, we never open up the Bible without a keen awareness of how dependent we are upon you in all of our ways. Everything we have, everything we ever hope to be, we owe it all to you. And so I humble my heart, not only before these people, but in your holy presence, and I ask you to strengthen mind, body, and spirit and quicken me by the Holy Spirit to share the truth of your eternal word. We are most certainly living in the final moments of human history and the perilous times that Bible prophecy warned us about surround us. We look to you for our strength. Through the Bible, you have given us the wisdom and the counsel of heaven on how to navigate perilous times and to walk in victory every day. My prayer is that not one person who hears me preach will be absent in eternity's morning, but I pray that through the preaching of the word today that you'll open their ears, open their eyes, and open their heart to the message of salvation and living ready to meet the Lord. And for all things, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. For we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. During a major Jewish holiday, early Saturday morning, Israel was struck by an unprecedented early morning surprise attack by a group called Hamas. Air raid sirens began sounding in Jerusalem at about 8.15 in the morning local time, warning the citizens of this unexpected attack. Quite frankly, Israel was caught unprepared. A nation that is usually on high alert at all times was caught in a weakened moment. And a stunned Israel tried to quickly mobilize their forces to defend and retaliate, immediately launching strikes into Gaza. Throughout the day, Hamas claimed that they had launched over 5,000 rockets into their targeted areas. Can you imagine? The entire statehood of Israel is smaller than the state of Connecticut. Imagine 5,000 rockets in a short amount of time. Not only were rockets fired, but borders were compromised. Trained forces strategically streaming in. 
They were coming in by hang gliders and an invasion like has never hit Israel in decades has been on the news and many people are obviously concerned. In a televised address on Saturday night, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who earlier had declared, quote, Israel is at war, end quote. That's quite a statement in and of itself. That in and of itself should be a major alarm clock, whether you're a Christian or an unbeliever. When the Prime Minister of Israel declares, we officially declare we are at war with the military prowess that Israel has, global leaders are wide awake. He went on to say that they will use their military strength to destroy Hamas capabilities and take revenge for this black day, end of quote. And then he warned, quote, this war will take time and it will be extremely difficult, end quote. So for all who think this is just a blip on the weekend radar of news, I think we need to pay attention to what the prime minister's intent is. He said we are at war, we will retaliate, we are going to exact justice like never before, and we are committed to a long-term war. Israeli media citing rescue service officials said, and I'm sure this number is already inaccurate, but as of my last setting to document, 250 plus people have already been killed, 1,500 wounded, making it the deadliest attack in Israel in decades. Hamas fighters also took an unknown number of civilians and soldiers into captivity in Gaza and will no doubt use them to heighten the terror and the fear. They have already posted, they've been on my digital documents, probably yours as well, the videos of horrific scenes of those that have been taken captive, some already tortured and murdered and put into social media. But as Christians living in the West, which is where I stand speaking today, how do we make sense of what could be the beginning of a major Middle East and regional conflict? Because I have preached and taught the Bible long enough to know that the average person really doesn't understand the complexities of Israel and the historic Middle East conflict. So if you're taking notes, if you'll allow me just a moment to lay what I believe to be a very important foundation to your understanding of Israel, the Middle East, and even Bible prophecy. Number one, five words that Christians should understand concerning modern Israel. Because I'm sure that many of you, if we were to sit down and chat, some of you would have perhaps a cursory knowledge, some would have absolutely no knowledge, some in the West don't care. As long as the bomb doesn't land in your backyard, you're impervious to anything that goes on. But if you're a believer, the Bible has commanded you to be an ally of Israel and Jerusalem in your thoughts, in your prayers, in your giving, and in your heart of concern and compassion. It is impossible to be a serious student of the Bible and a dedicated believer without understanding your responsibilities and your spiritual responsibilities to Israel, to Jerusalem, and to God's chosen people. Can I hear a good New England amen? amen. Number one, five words that Christians should understand concerning modern Israel. Now these are obviously going to be brief. Feel free to go back and do more in-depth study. I cannot do an exhaustive study on all of these in the time that we have. Number one, Hamas. That's the group taking full responsibility for this heinous attack. Hamas is an aggressive, fundamentalist, militant movement and one of Phil, uh, Palestine's territories, two major political parties. Word number two, Fatah. Fatah, formerly known as the Palestinian National Liberation Movement, is a Palestinian nationalist and social democratic political party. They are the 
counterpart of Hamas. Word number three, Palestine. Although the concept of Palestine uh, regionally and its geographical extent has been fluid throughout modern history and ancient history, in the Middle East as I speak, Israel and Palestine, don't miss this, share the land west of the Jordan River. Very important that you understand that if you're going to understand at least the geopolitical nature of this conflict. Palestine and Israel share the same land west of the Jordan River, using the word share lightly. Israel is predominantly a Jewish state, while Gaza and the West Bank are Palestinian and mostly Muslims and Arabs. So you can imagine just in that sentence the powder keg of having a small territory with multiple political groups and agendas, two of which exist to exterminate every Jew from the face of the planet, to have all of that in a small area occupying the same land, borders of which they do not even agree on. Number four, West Bank. People hear that all the time in the news. I've been to this part of the world, and so I have the advantage of the visual and the geography of actually being there and studying it, obviously, for four decades. The West Bank is one of two Palestinian territories. Don't forget that. There are two Palestinian territories, and they don't share the same borders. The West Bank is located within the country of Israel. And it is the larger of the two territories at approximately 2,173 square miles. The West Bank stretches across the eastern border of Israel and along the west banks of the Jordan River and most of the Dead Sea, which is why it has received the name the West Bank. The holy city of Jerusalem is considered by international law as part of the West Bank with East Jerusalem being claimed as the capital by both the Israelis and the Palestinians. So throw that complexity into what we've already discovered. They both claim Jerusalem as their capital. Number five, Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip is the second and smaller of the two Palestinian territories. And it's on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea. It borders Egypt on the southwest for about 11 kilometers and Israel on the east and north for about 51 kilometers. Both the West Bank and Gaza Strip were captured by Israel in the Six-Day War of 1967. There are over 5 million Palestinians combined living in those two territories. Muslims comprise 85% of the population of the West Bank and 99% of the population of the Gaza Strip. So there, in a very brief nutshell, is an overview of five words that you'll hear continually, have heard continually, on the news when we deal with Middle East complexities and now war. If you, as a Christian are going to understand what is going on, take time to rewind this teaching and go over those five words, fill in the blanks with your own study, but at least digest those five words and phrases and territories because until you understand that, you're not going to understand the detail of Bible prophecy in this area. Number two, what is Hamas fighting for? Why all of a sudden this unprecedented aggression? The Hamas group's charter calls for establishing an Islamic Palestinian state in place of Israel. Hamas does not even recognize Israel as a legitimate government. And in their charter, Islamics are committed to a word you do know, jihad which is simply a holy war 
and they want to take Palestine from the Jews and eliminate not only the state of Israel, they are committed to wiping every Jew off of the face of the earth. This is not just a Middle East problem. If you pay attention to any of the United Nations summits and the leaders that come from that part of the world, they stand on the floor of the United Nations here in the United States of America and scream with the necks bulging with veins, hatred on their face, swearing that they will eliminate not only Jews, but eliminate us in the West. Islamic Jihad is not a joke. And it is becoming more aggressive in the last years of my life than I have ever seen it. And what is more frightening for some is that they now have access to incredible military strength and weaponry that they've never had before. I remember much of my life watching these same players in the Middle East standing on the other side of fences throwing bricks and stones and handguns and pistols. But they now have the backing of nations like Iran and Turkey, which is another thing time will not permit me to preach on. But it is beyond grotesque, I'm trying to be graceful. It is beyond imagination that our current administration is sending untold millions of dollars to Iran, knowing that Iran is sharing that with Turkey and arming Hamas, and much of it being directed at the elimination of the statehood of Israel. It is anti-Semitism in a demonic level, and our nation has blood on its hands. And the Bible said, I'll bless those that bless Israel, and I'll curse those that curse Israel. If you think this conflict does not have impact and potential consequence upon our nation, you are living off grid with your head in the sand. Number three, does this newest war in Israel relate to Bible prophecy? This is the most frequent question that is coming in through my private messages and emails into the ministry. Not exactly word for word, but basically that sums up what I'm being asked. Many of my pastor friends have called in the last 24 hours and we've chatted and tried to have conversations. Many of them are trying to process exactly what's going on and how serious this is. But if you're taking notes on behalf of this message, number three, does this newest war, and again the word war in and of itself carries weight, does this newest war in Israel relate to Bible prophecy? Perhaps the most grandiose of questions on the minds of Christians and Westerners. In my four decades of ministry, and in your life as well, I have witnessed that every time there is a conflict in the Middle East, or around Israel, people quickly panic and fearfully proclaim, this must be the end. And social media lights up with what is oftentimes called clickbait. But this has escalated things perhaps to a different level that I've seen in maybe all of my ministry. People are genuinely wondering, is this Bible prophecy? Is this the beginning of the end? Is it this conflict that is going to call for some charismatic world leader to step forward and a meeting that perhaps could take place in Jerusalem where the signing of the peace treaty that begins the tribulation period could be in the near future? These are the things that students of the scripture are concerned about. The problem with placing unwarranted emphasis upon every Middle East conflict is that we as Christians can become desensitized to legitimate prophetic teaching. The proverbial crying of wolf, wolf, many times in the church, desensitizes believers in the West to the bigger picture of accurately what the Bible said and what will come to pass. Secondly, we can also foster a spirit of distrust 
among unbelievers and unchurched people concerning the believability of Bible prophecy if every time there's a hiccup in the Middle East, we have believers and spiritual leaders and denominational leaders crying, wolf, wolf, this is the end. And so that is not the proper approach for responsible believers. What is always the responsible approach is what does the Bible say? Not our opinions, not what are the denominational dogmas that are being woven through the geopolitical concerns, but what does the Bible say? Turn to Matthew chapter 24 and let's read the words of Jesus on this matter. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 6 through 8, Jesus said, And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Pause right there. Run a highlighter through that. The substantial believer should never panic in end time prophecy, no matter how bad things get. Because if you are living in true salvation, you are equally living in true security. Because ultimately, the worst thing that can happen is they can attack the temporary, but they cannot touch the eternal. I'm going to live forever. And no matter what happens to my body on this earth, I have the hope of a resurrection and a body that will one day be transformed from mortality to immortality. Jesus taught us in another passage, never fear those who have the ability to attack the physical body, but fear those who have the ability to cast your soul into hell. Well, I have good news for you. No one can cast your soul into hell but you. No one has the ability or the authority or the spiritual prowess to make your decision as to where you stand with God. That, my friend, is a personal decision. And in just a few moments, I'm going to challenge many of you to make that commitment. And many of you need to secure that commitment or come back home. Over 45% have wandered away from the church. It's time to come home. Jesus is about to return. And we need to live every day ready for that soon return. This is not the time for you to feud on Facebook and social media about what you like or dislike about the church or pastors or religion or religiosity. This is a time for intelligent people to get right with God and to live ready for the soon return of our promised Messiah. Chia cho 1 ngàn đó các bạn giờ dấu phải lên 3 số Rồi Tiếp tục chúng ta tính tần số Thì tần số nó là nghịch đảo của chu kỳ thôi chứ không có gì hết Đúng không ạ? F nè bằng 1 trên T nè 1 trên 0 phép 12 đơn vị là H Thế là xong cái bài số 4 của mình Được chưa? Xong cái bài số 4 mình nha rồi bây giờ tiếp tục chúng ta qua cái bài số 5 Xem nội dung bài số 5 như thế nào đây các bạn Bài số 5 Xét một vật dao động điều hòa có biên độ À biên độ là chữ A đó các bạn Tần số là chữ F Tại thời điểm ban đầu tức là tại thời điểm T0 bằng 0 nè Vật có ly độ cực đại và đi về bình dương Tức là lúc này X0 này bằng 0 Để Xin lỗi Ly độ cực đại mà X0 là bằng cộng E và về Đúng không? Vật có ly độ cực đại Và chuyển động về phía dương Đúng không ạ? Và chuyển động về phía dương tức là Thầy đọc lại nha Tại thời điểm ban đầu T bằng 0 Vật có ly độ cực đại Và về À ly độ cực đại về phía dương Tức là nó ở bình dương đó các bạn Đúng không ạ? Nó ở có hai cái ly độ nha các bạn lưu ý nè, đây không, đây là cộng A, đây là trừ A. Ly độ này là ly độ cực đại về phía dương, còn ly độ này về độ lớn nó là cực đại nhưng mà nó đang ở phía âm. Như vậy tại thời điểm T0 đây nó đang ở vị trí này đây các bạn, đúng không? Rồi, đề bài người ta hỏi mình, 
xác định chu kỳ tần số gấp pha ban đầu của dao động rồi bây giờ thầy tính chu kỳ nha t này bằng nghịch đảo của tần số là một trên năm thì nó ra là 0,2 giây rồi tần số gấp là omega bằng 2 bf đó hay bằng 2 bi chia t cũng được đó các bạn 2 bi x 